Gracious Word, presented by Church of Christ. Again, it's certainly good to be able to be with you uh, on this series of lessons regarding suffering and the providence of God. I certainly wish that I would be able to be there with you to deliver these lessons in person, but obviously that is simply not true. This is a very difficult time. The whole world has been under lockdown for several months, it seems. Many people have been suffering a great deal. Many have died because of this great pandemic. Indeed, it's a great time to consider this question of suffering and why does God allow such things to happen to us? It's a difficult question to consider, but nevertheless something we need to consider because the answers can very well determine whether we'll remain faithful to God or not. It's a great time of discouragement when things are not doing what are going as well as we would like them to happen. We often wonder why is God allowing such terrible things to happen to his people, to his church, when we cannot go out to evangelize or to teach or to preach like we would like to. I have a scheduled a series of lessons on this topic. I think there's seven or maybe eight lessons altogether so covering the idea of suffering and why we suffer and the providence of God. Certainly, I do not pretend to know all the answers or to be able to answer every question you might have on this topic because I think it's one of those things that we cannot really understand to a full extent because remember, we are talking about God. We are talking about the ways of God, and His ways are past our understanding. But nevertheless, hopefully we can come to some better understanding of this topic as we discuss it together. You know, there are several different viewpoints of life. For instance, the atheist view says that there is no God, and therefore God is not doing anything. Then there is the deist view. The deist said that there is a God, he created the world, but then once he created the world, he just kind of stepped back and he's not doing anything at all. In other words, again, God is not doing anything. Then there is the Pentecostal view that says God is continually working, and he's working through miracles almost on a daily basis. God is always blessing his people, miraculously speaking. Then there's a the Calvinist view. The Calvinist says that everything is predestined and nothing happens by accident. Everything happens just as God intended for it to happen. Everything is programmed to act or to happen. And there's really nothing we can do about it. Some people might call it fate. It's just fate that you do this or you be at a certain place at a certain time and so on and so forth. In other words, everything happens by plan. And then another viewpoint said that God is working through providence. The word providence means to see before. In other words, God sees beforehand. So therefore, he able to see before something happened that something is going to happen. And therefore, he's able to use that to accomplish his will, whatever that might be. Now, I'm sure that's the view that most all of us would prescribe to. And we'll talk about that, but it's going to be a little while before we get to that idea. First of all, I want to look at the question of where is God? And when I say, where is God? I mean, why is God not working? You know, it often seems as if God is not doing anything. You may be experiencing that now. You may be asking those very questions. Where is God? Why is he not doing anything? Well, this is nothing new. Man has asked similar questions throughout the ages. We find such questions being asked in the Old Testament, for instance. In Habakkuk, Habakkuk asked a question of why God is not doing anything to his day. Habakkuk was a prophet to the nation of Israel. At his time, the nation of Israel was a very wicked nation. They did not care for one another. They often mistreated one another. They were very wicked, and Habakkuk was wondering, God, why aren't you punishing these people? Why aren't you trying to bring them back? And then in verse 2, Eve asked a question. Oh, Lord, how long shall I cry for help? And you will not hear. Or cry to you violence, and you will not save. Noah's Abaca asked a question. Where are you, God? 
Why are you not listening? Why are you not doing anything? In Psalm 73, Asaph asked a similar question, except here he was not looking at the nation of Israel as such, but he was just comparing the wicked to the righteous. And it seems as if the wicked was being blessed far beyond the righteous. And he says in verse 3, For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Notice he said, I was envious of the righteous, I mean the wicked. Why? Because they were far more prosperous than the wicked. But then notice verse 16 and 17 of that same chapter. He said, when I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me. In other words, I could not really understand how it worked that way. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. Ah, you see, it doesn't make sense until we understand the full story, the whole long view of things, so to speak. You see, that's the problem that we have. We cannot understand the long view. We can only look at things from a very short-term view, from a momentary viewpoint. God, on the other hand, doesn't look at it that way. He has a long view of things. And that's one reason, at least, why things doesn't make sense to us, because we're looking at it from the wrong viewpoint. Psalm 44 is a lament psalm. That means it's a psalm that expressing the great sorrow and the frustration and the for sorrow of man, because here is a man who is suffering, and he is basically crying out to God. And so the author addresses the question of where is God in Psalm 44. Verses 1 through 8 praises God for his great miracles in the past. He talks about all the great things that God has done, how that God conquered Canaan and blessed his people and brought them into the great land. But then in verses 9 through 26, the psalmist wonders what happened. Because you see, God is not doing that anymore. Where are all the miracles that he had heard about in the past? Why could he not see God defending Israel in his day? He knew God could do that because he'd done it in the past. But he's not doing it anymore. Why is he not doing anything? Where is God? He even compares Israel as being sent to the slaughter. He pictures Israel as slaves being sold. He said other nations were laughing at Israel and that Israel was an object of scorn and derision. And he even points out in verses 17 and 18 that what was happening was not the result of great sin. He even mentions their faithfulness, their commitment to God their loyalty to God as their only true God. And I don't think the psalmist was trying to say that the people were perfect. They never did anything wrong, but he's just pointing out they were not living wickedly at this point in time. And even though they were not being really wicked, yet God was not blessing them. Why is that? Verse 23, he even used a picture of God sleeping. Verse 24, he asks, why is God hiding? And why is God not doing anything? Again, verse 24, he asked if God had forgotten his people. Now, he doesn't really answer those questions. But you see the situation. Here, even the long ago, you find ancient man asking some of the same questions that we're asking today. Why is God not doing anything? Where is God? Have you ever felt this way? I'm sure you have. I'm sure all of us at times have wondered, why is it that we're trying to live such righteous lives and yet seemingly always bad things happen to us? Indeed, God is often silent. Even when we look at the lives of great men of faith in the Bible, we find God is often silent. Think about Joseph, for instance. Now, we all know the story of Joseph. How that he was sold into slavery at a young age by his brothers. and But eventually he was raised to become second in command over the whole nation of Egypt. Indeed, we look at that and think, oh, that's a great success story. 
that shows how God is going to bless his people and God is going to take care of us. But remember, for years, there seemed to be nothing happening. For years, it seems as if God was not doing anything. Because we don't know how long exactly Joseph, for instance, was serving in the house of Potiphar. Indications are at least anywhere from five to ten years. And then he was sold, I mean, put in prison for an unjust accusation, something he'd never done. And still, it seemed as if God was not doing anything. In other words, look at it from Joseph's standpoint as he was living this life. Not for just a year or two years or even three years or even five years. For many years, he was being treated very unjustly. And it seems as if God was silent. God was not doing anything. You see, Joseph could not look at the long view because he didn't know how it was all going to turn out when he was living it. But nevertheless, he remained faithful to God. You see, many people turn away from God because they want material blessings and they want it now. Many turn away from God because they misunderstand what God's promises is. They think that God has promised, or at least he should have promised, health and prosperity to his followers. You know, as they falsely reason that God should bless his people in a very materialistic way. And if I'm being righteous, then God must bless me. If he doesn't bless me, then that means one of two things. Either I'm not righteous or God is not concerned with me. But, of course, we know that does not always occur that way, does it? Because we know there are righteous people who does not seem to be blessed very much. In other words, many people falsely reason that God cannot do anything else other than bless his people. For instance, they falsely reason, God must bless his people. Now, why doesn't he bless his people? Well, one, either he's not able to do it. No, words, he's not all powerful. Or second, he can bless his people, but he does not want to. If that's the case, then he's not all loving. So either way, you find God is not the God of which you read about in the Bible because God must bless his people, so they say. And if he doesn't, then that either means one of two things. He's not all loving or he's not all powerful. Well, how can we evaluate this idea? Well, first of all, we need to consider that this idea assumes ignorant man is qualified to pass judgment upon God's actions. In other words, it assumes that we, in our very limited viewpoint, can judge God and his actions and judge them as being good or bad, righteous or unrighteous. But God's ways are beyond human analysis. For instance, look at Isaiah 33, verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. In other words, God says, you cannot understand me. You cannot understand my thinking. And I'm not going to act the way you think I should act. Because your ways, they're not my ways. So God says, I'm not going to always act the way you think I should act. And you're not going to be able to understand that either. So we see that God even tells us, Don't try to reason everything out because you're not going to be able to do it. But nevertheless, we often try to do that, don't we? Look at Romans 11, verse 33. Paul again declares, Oh, the depth and the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. In other words, God, look at the wisdom of God, the knowledge of God. Is it far greater than ours? And of course, the answer, well, obviously, yes. God knows much more than we will ever know and understand. He even goes on, he said, how unsearchable are his judgment and how inscrutable his ways. In other words, you won't be able to understand God and his judgments and the way he acts. So therefore, don't try to pass judgment on the actions or the seemingly inaction of God. God has his own ways and we must realize that his ways are not our ways. But nevertheless, the idea that one's character can be determined by health and prosperity is a widespread belief. Now, it's a false generalization, but nevertheless, 
It's very widespread, isn't it? While I was there in India, I've heard people express this very idea. I know God is blessing me because look at how blessed I am. Therefore, God must be pleased with me. But you know, everybody could make that same argument. Atheists could sometimes make that argument. Hindus could make that argument. Muslims could make that argument. Buddhists can make that argument. Christians can make that argument. Every church can make that same argument. Indeed, I've heard some so-called Christians of denominations say, well, I know God is blessing us because look how we've grown. Look at what nice building we have. Look at this. Look at that. We know God is blessing us. You know what? God is pleased with us because of what we have. Now, that's the way we reason. But that's not always true, is it? Because if that was true, then we would have to conclude that many of the people of the Bible that are looked upon as being so righteous would be unrighteous. For instance, Joseph again. During the many years that Joseph was suffering as a slave and in prison, he could have easily judged that God had forgotten all about him. He could have very easily judged that God did not care for him because for several years, absolutely nothing happened. Job suffered a great deal. We know that. Now you look at Job and you would think, well, he must be suffering because of sin. Because again, we think good people are blessed. Wicked people are punished. Indeed, that's what his friend said. His friend said, Go, Job, you must have done something wrong because look how you're being punished. But they were wrong, weren't they? In Job's case, he was not being punished as a result of sin. He was actually being punished because he was so good. Because of his great righteousness, Satan picked him out to be a great test. So we see Job suffering because of his righteousness, not because of his wickedness. You see, that's the very opposite of what we would conclude. And again, Asaph in Psalm 73, remember he was the one that looked upon the wicked. And he wondered, why was the wicked being blessed so much more than the righteous? Then verses 16 and 17. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood therein. You see, again, you got to take the long view. Looking at it from a, just a very short-term view, a very momentary view, from our viewpoint, from a materialistic standpoint, it looks as if the wicked is enjoying life so much more than the wicked. But then you look at the end result. You look at what happens at the end, and you have a whole different story. Because at the end, God is going to make all things right. You see, godliness cannot always be judged by material blessings. This is one great statement that we need to really understand. Godliness cannot always be judged by material blessings. Jesus lived a life of poverty. Now we know Jesus was certainly very righteous. He even stated on more than one occasion, God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So Jesus lived a life of complete service to God. And yet he says, he did not even have a place to lay his head. From a human standpoint, it would look like Jesus lived a life of complete failure. He had no blessings, materially speaking. He was destroyed and killed at a very young age, only 33 or so, we think. In other words, he died very unjustly. But that's what it looks like to us. And, but that was all part of God's plan, wasn't it? Paul suffered a great deal. You read about all the great things that Paul suffered. Even read that list that Paul mentions in the Corinthian letter. And we know that Paul suffered a great deal, more than any of us ever will, probably. He frequently lived in poverty. Did that prove God? I mean, Paul was a wicked man? Well, obviously not. Paul, indeed, was a very righteous man. But he was not always blessed, like you think a righteous man should be blessed. Now, that doesn't mean God is always going to bless the wicked or that God is always going to punish the righteous because the opposite is also true. God can and often does bless his people in a physical way that is consistent with his own will. And that's the key, from in a way that is consistent with his own will. Now, we cannot always determine what that will is. Therefore, to us, it might not seem fair. 
but it's still consistent with the will of God. And in Philippians 2, in verse 27, we find that Epaphroditus, a co-worker of the Apostle Paul, was very sick. Paul said he was sick near death, but God had mercy on him. Now, apparently, there was no miracle involved here, but that God did bless him in such a way that he was able to recover from this very serious illness, whatever it might have been. But it does not mean that God, Christian, will always recover. Because if God always blessed Christians in that way, then, of course, no Christian would ever die. Now, we might like that to happen, but we know, of course, that doesn't happen. There's going to come a time, as in the case of every human being, when we're going to get sick or something going to happen to us and we're going to die. This life is not eternal. It's going to end in some way or the other. No matter how righteous you are, you're going to die. That's just a fact of life, isn't it? So just because you are a Christian doesn't mean God is going to always bless you so that you'll recover from some illness. God providentially directed ravens to provide Elijah with bread. 1 Kings 17, verses 6, 4 and 6. You see, God took care of Elijah on that occasion. He made special provisions for Elijah. Jesus urged us to pray for our daily food. Apparently, Jesus believes that God makes special provisions for his people at times. So what God does sometimes bless his people in a special way. One's health or prosperity is not a reflection upon God's ability, his love, or his concern for us. And it certainly is not always a measure of one's righteousness. Just because I might be blessed more physically, more materially than you are, does not mean that I'm more spiritual than you. And the same is true vice versa. Or the same is true for any case you might look at. You see, if it was a rule that spirituality always produced health and wealth, then think about some things that would have to happen. Okay, now let's assume this. Let's assume that spirituality always resulted in health and wealth. Then what would happen? Well, little children, who are, we all believe would be the purest of all the people on the earth, well, obviously they would never get sick and die. Now, we know that doesn't happen. Little children sometimes get sick and they die. Sometimes for no reason that we can explain but they still die. The wicked of the earth are sometimes more prosperous than the godly, and the righteous do not always outlive the wicked. We know wicked people who live very long lives, and righteous people who live very short lives. You know, it doesn't always result that way. But think about it. If wealth always was the direct result of becoming a Christian, then why would people become Christians? Would not many people become Christian just so they could enjoy great wealth and prosperity? Well, I think so. Now, that's obviously not a very good reason to become a Christian, is it? But that's exactly the charge that God made to Job. You remember, Satan went to God and says, Why are men serving you? They're not serving you because of they love you. They're not serving you because they really care for you or that they are loyal to you. No, they're serving you for one reason and one reason only, because you are blessing them. God said, well, what about Job? So Satan said, okay, let's look at Job. Look at what you've done to him. You have blessed him greatly, given him great riches, gave him a great honor, good family. Everything is going good for him. You take away those things and you'll see what happens. So Satan I mean, God allowed Satan to take away those things. But Job did not curse God, did he? You see, Satan thinks that's the reason why a man is serving God, because we're, oh, God is only blessing us. But that's not true. But such a motive would bring no honor to God or to man. If men serve God only for the riches, that reason they want blessings or they want riches, that would not bring any honor to God. So we see then even one possible reason why it is not good that God always bless his people with great wealth. So God sometimes does bless his people in a special way. Sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes he treats all men alike. For instance, Genesis 8, verse 22. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. 
Now, we know that everyone who lives on the earth enjoys all of those things just like everyone else. It doesn't matter whether you're righteous or whether you're wicked. You're going to see day or night just like we do. You're going to see summer and winter just like everyone else. You're going to see seed time and harvest just like everyone else. It's all the same. In other words, the world that we live in is the same to everyone. Matthew 5, verse 45. For he makes his sun to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. When it rains, it doesn't just rain on the fields of the good people, does it? No, it rains on the fields of everyone. And when floods come, it doesn't just flood the houses of the wicked people. It may also flood the houses of the good people as well. That's the way nature works. It's the way water works, isn't it? You see, God is often impartial in his kindness. In some ways, God is also impartial in his the bad things that happen to us. Just as illnesses come to all people, good or bad. This pandemic has affected everyone, good or bad. It makes no difference. But nevertheless, God has at times special, promised special provisions for his righteous. Now, we need to always remember that God has promised special blessings for the righteous people. Look at Psalm 34, verses 6 and 7. The poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him and saved him from all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. Here we find the psalmist said, God will take care of his people, and God will save him. For Psalm 34, verse 19, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Oh, that's a great promise, isn't it? A great blessing. So Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him or acknowledge God. And he will make straight your paths. God will bless you, the proverb wise man said. Again, going back to Psalm 84, verse 11 and 12. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. In these verses, it says that God is a light to dispel darkness in your life. God is a sun and a shield to protect against dangers. He said that God will not forsake the righteous and he will only give good things to you. He will not withhold the good things. There is nothing that is good for you that God will withhold from you, the psalmist says. And then, of course, Peter says in 1 Peter 3, verse 12, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Notice here, Paul, I mean, Peter has a contrast. A contrast between how God deals with the righteous and how God deals with the wicked. His eyes are on the righteous. and He always is open to their prayers. But the, his face is against those. In other words, he actively fighting against those who are wicked. So that's what the Bible says. But then again, you compare that with reality, and it doesn't seem to work too well, does it? Because we look at reality, and even though God has promised to deliver his people, and God has promised special blessings for his people, it doesn't seem to work that way. It seems that God is not blessing his people, certainly not in a very special way. It seems as if God is not really protecting his people at all. God is not working. You see, that's the question then we're going to look at next lesson. I'm going to stop here. And then we could look at this question. How should we react when we cannot see God working? How should we react when we experience a seeming contradiction between reality and what we know God's promises really is? So I hope this will be beneficial and encouraging to each one of you. Thank you. It is God's will that you must be saved. First, listen to the Bible truth. And you must believe the truth. Then you must repent from your sinful life. Then you must confess by words that the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God. You must be baptized for the remission of your sins. 
every day our lord added those who were being saved into his church be blessed by studying the word of god to receive the voice of truth international magazine and to study the bible systematically through our english bible correspondent course kindly write to us our address gracious word po box 15 Arsradi Madurai 625016 Tamil Nadu For more details dial 9244204420 9244214421 God bless you The Church of Christ salutes you Joy Creative Production For video coverage and editing audio recording and editing promo for advertisement graphic design contact 9042494996